When discussing the somewhat spooky potentials of developing technology today, the focus is usually on our increasingly powerful artificial intelligence. Rightfully so, AI is going to get downright scary in coming years. And you can just imagine based on what we have today, what that will look like in 20 years. In a way though, the focus on AI has served to somewhat obscure some of their developing technologies that could end up every bit as controversial and important. One of these is nanotechnology. This burgeoning field is already here. We've been miniaturizing our electronics from the start and that trend continues. Your phone, for example, is more powerful in computing power than a 1950s computer was. And it's designed to be handheld, whereas the 1950s computer was the size of a house. This trend, however, is going to encompass more than just computers, but also spawn entirely new devices, specifically in the realm of nanotechnology. One of these is already technologically possible, and it's known as smart dust. This technology is basically what it sounds like, and consists of tiny robots or detectors that can measure light, magnetism, chemicals, vibration, and so on, and work by wireless network. It had been predicted by a number of science fiction authors, going back to at least 1964 with Stanislaw Lem. There's even a proposal on using smart dust to measure wind and weather patterns over relatively short distances. There are a ton of potential uses for smart dust. One would be monitoring the temperature of food products for quality purposes, such as milk or meat to protect against spoilage or contamination further shrinking of RFID products in inventory, monitoring vibration and impact in machinery and devices, and even monitoring when something is about to fail by the frequency signatures it's emitting. With that comes more spooky uses. Such dust would be invaluable in spying, as has been pointed out in more than just science fiction. For example, imagine just dropping some dust containing microphones on a floor in a room where secret things are said. Battlefield monitoring could be done with it, and a whole host of other military applications. And indeed, the idea was first pursued by DARPA, the U.S. Department of Defense's Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. The downside to this, however, is that it would be very difficult to make such devices that tiny impervious to the effects of microwave radiation and other electromagnetic effects. For them to communicate their data at all, they have to do it with detectable radio signals making it possible to sweep for them and disable them. But there is another aspect of this that is quite a bit more disturbing and may be harder to identify and figure out as these technologies continue to miniaturize and develop. The concept here is still hypothetical but scary. Known as neural dust, this form of nanotechnology would come as nanometer level wirelessly powered robots that can directly interface with nerves and brain cells. It would be a brain-computer interface far more powerful than the still rather primitive interfaces we have today. But those current devices are proof of concept. The idea of neural dust first appeared around 2011 conceptually, and the original intent was monitoring. We have been able to use electronics to monitor brain activity for literally a hundred years. 2024 is the anniversary of the invention of the electroencephalogram. At first glance, Neural dust holds immense promise in the field of medicine. You can use neuroprosthetics to restore function for people suffering spinal injuries and other nervous system disorders. This is done simply by replacing the lost function instead with wireless technology instead of biology. But it goes further. Right now, with some forms of hearing loss, doctors can treat that with cochlear implants, which work, but imperfectly, and are highly invasive. It's much the same with retina disorders. With spinal injuries, there is much promise, but also for conditions like ALS, which is what Stephen Hawking's condition was, where the function of nerves could conceivably be replaced, at least to some degree initially, with wireless neural dust. It's unlikely to be a true restoration of function, but augment that with other developing technologies and it could improve as time goes on. How neural dust is envisioned to work is simple. You implant the dust in the brain and then place a device on or in the dura mater subcranially to power and monitor the signals from the dust. The communication can be done with radio or ultrasonics or any of several other methods. 
Care has to be taken in the management of heat from these electronic systems, given that they are sitting in very sensitive brain tissue, an outstanding problem. You can't let this stuff overheat. As envisioned, the sensors in the brain would be too small, at least right now, to contain a true transmitter. So the idea is to take a page from RFID where you can passively reflect radio energy from the sensors to the subdural device, known as an interrogator that collects the data. Based on what we already do with electrical stimulation of the nervous system, other areas where the concept might eventually be applicable is in treating things like sleep apnea, epilepsy, and Parkinson's disease. But again, it pays to remember that there are other applications for these technologies. For example, another ongoing DARPA project is to essentially develop cyborg insects. Here you could use neural dust or other means to implant an insect during its pupil stage that could lead to the ability to control its motion, something that's already possible in a primitive form. This can be used for a number of applications including detecting explosives or chemical weapons deployment. Another project by DARPA involves implanting sharks, which are known for their powerful senses, to be used to detect ship movements and various underwater weaponry. Implanting insects is now an old idea. In 2006, Cornell successfully implanted moths with electronics, and further work with cockroaches allowed them to be effectively and remotely controlled by humans using impulses generated by electrodes. Subsequent experiments have built on this, and now include rats, pigeons, and numerous other insects. Cybernetic rats have even been proven to be able to detect explosives. And once again, the ability to control insects and somehow hide the mechanism you are using to do that, then you have something that is eminently useful in espionage and on the battlefield. The dual nature of both good and bad uses for these technologies have come into play, and even the form of this technology commonly used today such as deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's, has been shown to have some apparent side effects, at least early on, that include apathy, compulsive gambling, cognitive issues, and depression. Some futurists project that brain implants will become much greater and could include augmentation, allowing for abilities above and beyond what a human normally has. This could include increasing intelligence and IQ, and even things like electronic mental telepathy, where two brains could interact through neural implants, potentially even wirelessly through radio signals. I am not bullish on this aspect of this technology. While I think some will try it, there are always people out there that will alter their bodies, the alteration here is so fundamental that it could dramatically change who a person is. I'm not sure there will be many takers after a few initial tries, though it will remain fundamentally important in medical science because such technology may prove useful as a treatment for mental illness not so easily treated with drugs. And there is already something in place that may serve as a huge roadblock in the development of brain augmentation. Known as the Helsinki Declaration of 1964, it serves as the cornerstone guide on the ethics of human experimentation. While not legally binding in international law, the declaration is expected to be followed by medical personnel and generally, but not always, has been. This may easily lead to a movement against augmentation research within the scientific community, and very likely the theologians, ethicists, and a great many other areas. So while I have indeed used brain augmentation as a plot device in a novel, it's called Supermind for a reason, I consider it only in a worst-case sci-fi scenario sense, and I think the reality of a large part of the population augmenting themselves to be unlikely. Rather, I think those that refuse augmentation will greatly outnumber them. And in my scenario, the augments were the ruling class, but I'm not so sure that would happen in real life. There may be a huge social bias that develops against augmented people that may drive people not to do it. A form of this was famously depicted in Star Trek, going all the way back to the days of Captain Kirk and Khan, where there was a severe bias and even a war over genetic augmentation, leading the Federation to ban it and a bias against it to form up. As an aside, if you're a Star Trek fan, tell me what your favorite Star Trek movie is in the comments below. Not an episode, but a feature-length movie. Mine, hands down, is The Wrath of Khan. And finally is perhaps the greatest fear possible in brain implantation that may also lead it to never being developed, and that's hacking. 
You can think of scenarios like intrusive surveillance, perhaps by a government, hacking and cybercrime, and even computer viruses, as though we don't already have enough problems with biological viruses. And then there is control. One can easily see a scenario here worthy of George Orwell and Aldous Huxley, where an entity, call it Big Brother, uses neural implants to control the thoughts of the population, probably initially claiming it's for their own good, or perhaps tricking the population into getting them and falling under the desired control. Imagine a population thinking an exact lockstep as a controlled hive mind with whatever the powers that be dictate. A very spooky possibility for sure, and one that may never be possible for reasons we haven't yet foreseen. But again, I do not think we will ever fully accept this type of technology and take it to its furthest hypothetical extent. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently addressing those that are sleepy. I often get asked for compilation videos of past content for sleep purposes. A conundrum of sorts is I didn't want to repost old content here or at Event Horizon. I like to keep things fresh with new videos. But now we have a fix. Let me introduce you to the JMG Clips channel, link in the description below, where we're posting compilations of videos from here and Event Horizon for relaxation and snoozing. I know you're currently thinking, JMG, a three hour video isn't a clip, but I say, hey, we clipped them all together. Nothing new there yet, but it's my greatest hits album. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we sleep.